Now, one thing to keep in mind as we are looking at all of these questions of cybercrime, and we have seen that, of course, cybercrime is an international phenomenon, but there is no international criminal cyber law. In fact, except in some very limited senses uh, dealing with crimes against humanity, there really is no international criminal law at all. Criminal law, for the most part, is left to national and local law. And there is an international criminal court that is really mostly dealing with war crimes, but there's no international court or international tribunal that's dealing with cybercrime. There is a treaty that dates back to 2001 that I asked you to skim through, which is the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. And the Budapest Convention does commit the member states to that treaty to agree to minimum standards for their national computer crimes law. Minimum standards is a common way for a treaty to help coordinate the law in different areas of the law across different countries. So the treaty does not mandate what national law must contain in specifics, but it does say that national law must contain at least this much. And if you look at the specific minimum standards in the Budapest Convention, you'll see that they're pretty consistent with the U.S. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and with the EU com computer crimes law that we have already looked at. It also establishes minimum standards for process for obtaining electronic records, and that includes uh, subscriber information, it includes static content information, and it includes real-time content uh, interception, in other words, wiretap. The Budapest Convention also includes principles of international cooperation in criminal investigations and including mutual assistance. So mutual assistance is the idea that, you know, the U let's say the U.S. Justice Department is um, investigating cybercrime involving actors that the U.S. Uh, Justice Department has reason to believe are located, let's say, in France. Um, the U.S government is not able directly to serve legal process in France. It's not able to serve a search warrant for facilities located in France. Um, it is able to serve a search warrant in the U.S. that might have some extraterritorial effect, but if it wants to serve a warrant in France, it's got to use process in France. Well, how does it do that? The only way to do that is if there is a treaty regime that establishes mechanisms through which the U.S. Justice Department can go to French authorities and ask the French authorities to cooperate and uh, perhaps to domesticate the U.S. search warrant into a French warrant and to proceed from there. And that's exactly what the Convention on Cybercrime requires. Now we'll see that there's a proposed amendment to this convention that has not yet been adopted that would expand some of these uh, cooperation obligations. and. If you speak to people in the Justice Department or the FBI and in, in law enforcement um, in the U.S., they will say, yes, these, um, these MLATs, these mutual uh, legal assistance trees are helpful, but they can be very clunky, they can be very slow moving, their effect can differ from country to country, uh, and they argue that this procedure needs to be uh, streamlined and made easier. Now, certain civil liberties groups argue that um, you know the, the the more streamlined, the easier you make this, the closer you get actually to international internet surveillance. And this raises a really interesting question about internet governance in relation to national law. So, you know, are these treaties really creating a kind of quasi-international? privacy surveillance criminal law um, or not when we talk about the internet. Now, I asked you to look specifically at Article 35 of the Budapest Convention which establishes a 24-7 network for immediate assistance and you'll see when we talk in a few moments about the most recent proposed addendum to the convention that there are proposals to beef this up as well and again this is an area of um, of real contention between some law enforcement and some civil liberties groups.
The Budapest Convention, the basic convention, has been signed onto by numerous countries, including the United States. And so this is a broadly applicable convention. Now we will talk about a, an existing addendum to the Convention on Hate Speech and then the proposed uh, further addendum. And we'll see this uh, a protocol on hate speech in, uh, adopted in 2003, which I also asked you to look at. This is something the U.S. has not signed on to. And the U.S. has not signed on to this specifically because the U.S. says that its um, commitments under the First Amendment, its civil liberties commitments regarding freedom of speech, would not allow it to sign on to this convention regarding hate speech as it is currently structured, whereas most of the European countries have signed on to um, the convention as to hate speech. And, and so we'll talk about this additional protocol a little bit later. I'll show you some examples of uh, German law and French law and Australian law um, that have different perspectives, different takes on relating to terrorist or hate speech online than we currently do in uh, in the United States. So the additional protocol, as you see, Article 3 requires, again, it's a minimum standards, requires national governments to adopt legislation against distributing certain kinds of material, racist and xenophobic material. And see, this is, under U.S. First Amendment law, this kind of term um, is too vague. Um, and is could potentially be protected speech under the First Amendment. We've seen that um, the First Amendment is really broad, even when it comes to obscenity. We've seen that child pornography is not protected speech. Um, but, you know, racist speech, xenophobic speech, is speech that, you know, uh, any kind of civilized uh, person within the U.S. ought to agree is bad speech. Um, but nevertheless, it is likely to be speech that's protected under the First Amendment so long as it's not uh, directly inciting violence. The, the protocol would require a civil remedy for hate speech. It does include uh, kind of carve-outs that can be adopted into national law based on the national law's view of free speech principles. So this, even though the U.S. has not signed this, it still does, for other countries that have, create specific national law carve-outs for free speech questions. Um, but notice that it would, it does require, subject to those potential carve-outs, countries that sign on to it to make racist or xenophobic threats a criminal offense. Now in the US, there, as we have seen in looking at our law on cyber stalking, a true threat is something that is not necessarily protected by the First Amendment. So again, U.S. law could be consistent with this, um, but the U.S. has still thought it too broad to include specifically what a racist or xenophobic threat might mean. Um, it also goes even further, and this is something that certainly U.S. law um, under the First Amendment almost certainly would not allow which is to require criminalization of a racist or xenophobic insult, or at least to allow the uh, criminalization of a racist or xenophobic insult. And that goes much broader than um, U.S. law under the First Amendment would really allow. All right, and uh, also applies to uh, activity that would relate to acts of genocide or crimes of humanity, that is... Um, cybercrime activity that would relate to acts of genocide or crimes against humanity. In, in recent years, the EU has really tried to ramp up its uh, legal oversight of social media and other content providers relating to uh, terrorist and hate speech and, and uh, xenophobic and racist speech. In March of 2018, the EU published what it called illegal content guidelines. Um, now, these guidelines are not a directive, are not a regulation, are not actually binding law, um, but they were issued to the social media companies as sort of suggesting here's a way you can 
properly cooperate with law enforcement and also su kind of suggesting that there might be further uh, directives or regulations coming along these lines. And the concept behind this is the idea that the providers should have some kind of responsibility, um, a moral responsibility if not a legal one, to remove content that is deemed illegal under national law. And so among the, among the guidelines includes the, the content providers having procedures so that um, individuals both working for the companies and who are part of the, the social media community can flag content that comes quickly to the attention of the company. Um, tools and technology that allow the company to remove illegal content. Again, in particular, the concern is um, terrorism content as well as child sexual abuse material. And, you know, tools, proactive tools here, um, you should hear artificial intelligence. You should hear automation um, that they're asking the companies to impl implement. Um, safeguards, so they do want, uh, you know, safeguards for users whose content is removed. Um, and that includes some human oversight in the process. So they're asking, they're asking the companies to use automated tools, but they're also asking the companies to have some human oversight to double check um, and closer cooperation with authorities. And this question of how closely the companies are cooperating with law enforcement authorities, as we've seen, is always a fraught question. Um, this piece, this one hour rule, within these EU guidelines was a particularly um, controversial one. And what they were asking is that if it is terrorist content, that the provider should have the ability to remove that content within one hour of being referred that, you know, whether it's by a user or whether it's by a government authority, that it is terrorist content. So that was pretty controversial, but this is something the EU has requested of the social media providers. Now, I mentioned that the there is a first additional protocol to the Convention on Cybercrime to which the U.S. has not acceded. There is now a proposed second additional protocol to the Convention on Cybercrime, which I think the U.S. would likely would likely accede to. All of what all of this is about is trying to beef up the um, notification and reporting and cooperation requirements in the original protocol, in the original Budapest protocol. And um, some have called this a cloud amendment to the Budapest protocol because effectively what it's recognizing is that, you know, the world in 2021 is very different than the world was in 2001 in terms of how information is stored by different providers, which is usually, you know, broken up into multiple pieces and stored across different borders. Um, and so this would do a bunch of different things. It would require providers to uh, domain name providers, domain name registrars, um, to keep accurate information and to supply that identifying information of who's registered to a domain name upon request. Um, this has this has proved to be pretty controversial with some civil rights groups who are arguing that it would completely destroy the ability to remain anonymous online. And remember, this is why we looked at that, um, you know, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog cartoon in the very beginning. Um, this is a big issue now. Um, the requirement for uh, service providers to provide subscriber information you know, this is consistent with the Budapest Protocol, but would sort of beef up and speed up some of those procedures in Article 7. Um, Article 8 would allow for a easier way to domesticate an order for subscriber information. So remember, I was talking about those multiple legal assistance treaties, and sometimes they're clunky. So one of the ways in which they're clunky is you know, it's relatively easy under U.S. law and under the law of many European member states within the jurisdiction 
to get subscriber information, not content information, from a service provider. Um, but if you get that, you know, that Section 2703D order under the ECPA in the U.S., and then you find that the person has an account um, with, you know, a company with Facebook in France or something like that, it can get a little tricky about whether you can I implement that order as to the French information. And, in, and so instead of having to get a um, more difficult to get MLAT, this would make getting that subscriber information order domesticated uh, quicker and easier. Article 9 would require expedited disclosure of stored information without even a request for mutual assistance. So Article 8, the speeding up of the mutual assistance obligations is, again, itself somewhat controversial among civil liberties groups because it starts to look like you're creating a more internationalized criminal procedure authority for cyberspace that's different from regular space. Um, but Article 9 even more so because now you're saying simply upon a request without a formal mutual assistance obligation, if there's some you know re expedited reason for it, so you know an immediate terrorist threat, an immediate threat to health or safety. Um, the law enforcement authorities say we need this because we, we don't even want to have you know a 24 hour or a 40 hour, eight hour delay to domesticate an order. The civil liberties groups say anytime you see you know expedited or emergency, that creates that loophole you can drive a truck through. Article 10 sets out the procedures for emergency mutual assistance. You don't need to worry about the details of that. Um, but just notice there there is there are some set procedures, but they're relatively simple procedures to put this um, emergency authority into place. Article 12 establishes some procedures to establish joint investigative teams. There already are you know, plenty of joint investigations, say between Interpol and the FBI, uh, that go on, and Article 12 would formalize some of that and make some of that a little bit easier. Um, Article 14 is you know, something that law enforcement advocates of this additional protocol will cite to the civil liberties groups because it does include protections for personal data and many of those protections are um, similar to the privacy protections that exist in the GDPR, in the, in the European Data Privacy Regulation. Um, you know, the, the question still though for civil liberties groups is, uh, you know, are those really adequate, first of all, um, to maintaining the further disclosure of that information, but on the front end, I mean, even the GDPR allows, of course, the use of legal process. Um, does it does it really guarantee the basic um, fundamental rights of privacy when it makes it much easier for the government to get that in information in the for a government to get that information in the first place than it might otherwise be? And is it really again, creating this kind of um, multinational or international regime for cyberspace um, that is exceptional and doesn't necessarily exist the same way in the physical world. So let's now talk about the national law in some specific countries. And we'll start with Germany. I didn't have you read this whole statute because it's a little bit long, but I'll, I'll kind of summarize it. And it's been called the Netz DG law. And you can see in the summary here of section one of the NETS GD law that it applies to basically all social media companies. And in section three, it requires those companies to have a procedure for handling complaints about unlawful content. And it requires them to remove or block content that is manifestly unlawful within 24 hours, or that is just, just unlawful, within seven days. So putting an obligation on the service provider to affirmatively block or remove content is a strong step that can be taken in national law. It is not, generally speaking, a step that is taken in U.S. law. You could say that for child pornography materials in the U.S. there is such a requirement because those materials are contraband. Uh, but in general, content that is purported to be, um, you know, 
hate speech or even terroristic content, this kind of affirmative obligation um, is is not what we normally see in U.S. law. So this is a kind of strong step. And then, you know, this distinction between manifestly unlawful and unlawful, obviously, regardless of the definitions in the law of what that means, is going to be really difficult for the social media company or service provider to figure out. I mean, it's going to require some lawyers making some legal judgments. Uh, and I, frankly, as a lawyer, I'm not even unsure, sure what manifestly unlawful versus it's either unlawful or it's not. Um, but you know, the 24 hours is a very short turnaround time. And so you can imagine that if you're in compliance in, you know, say YouTube or Facebook, as it relates to Germany, um, you're going to probably err on the side of caution in removing things that, that uh, quickly that might fall under this provision. Um, the statute identifies what unlawful content means. Um, and you know you should note this is not a the definition of unlawful content is not in distinction to manifestly unlawful. Manifestly unlawful means it's unlawful content that on the face of it, you know it should be obvious in some way that it's unlawful. And you know notice here, a real cultural difference in German law from American law, which is the use of Nazi symbols and pro propaganda. In US law, the use of Nazi symbols and propaganda is protected by the First Amendment. Now, if, you know, if it is inciting violence, uh, if it is actually literally calling people to arms and to commit violence, that incitement is not protected by the First Amendment. But you know, merely using a swastika or other Nazi symbol or um, trading in um, copies of Mein Kampf or trading in um, copies of neo-Nazi propaganda is protected by the First Amendment as as horrible as most of us think that content is. And in German law, for historical reasons, obviously, it is not. And, you know, in German law, it's not only kind of neo-Nazi skinhead type groups that this is uh, geared at, although that is a significant problem even today in Germany. Um, but even things like historical memorabilia and the like, uh, trading of those things is unlawful. Um, encouragement of violence, uh, endangering peace, um, you know, endangering peace, that's a pretty broad um, thing. I mean, some of these, you know, incitement crimes could be crimes in the U.S. as well. Um, incitement of hatred, you know, this again is a really broad category. What does incitement of hatred mean when you're talking about um, a religious group, ethnic origins, um, you know, speech that in the U.S. we might consider morally offensive uh, because it's, it's racist, but we'd still consider protected by the First Amendment, potentially violates this German law and therefore potentially requires the service provider or social media company to take it down. And likewise, you know, for simply insult, slander, or defamation, I mean insult, if you think about social media and uh, the category of insult relating to some sort of characteristic like, like gender or race or, or religion or philosophy, that's a pretty broad category. The penalties under the NETS GD law are potentially substantial, up to 500,000 euros for failure to comply. And providers are required to designate an agent for service of process. This means even if the provider is not a German company, it must have an agent in Germany to receive process and so that it's able to comply with the law. So let's look a little bit at the law in France. And again, I didn't give you all this to read, but I want to summarize it for you a little bit. So there's a number of different overlapping laws in France that we could look at. In 2014, France passed an anti-terrorism law, uh, which is a really strong anti-terrorism law. And as you know, uh, as in Germany, France has had some significant problems with um, terrorist incidents on, on French soil. So it's a real, real concern. Uh, and there's a real difficulty in France, as you probably know, kind of balancing that out. Uh, against the problem of Islamophobia um, and in relation to European issues about migration, particularly from Syria and from northern African countries, where all of those big issues are tied up in these questions. So uh, like in Germany, Holocaust denial, of course, because of the Vichy 
history and the history of collaboration in France is unlawful, um, but, but other kinds of terrorist content as well. There is a French central office that manages these um, requests and requirements. That office can uh, require a, a site to block material involving terrorism or child abuse. Um, after a 24-hour sort of um, voluntary period, it can issue a mandatory requirement and it can require that search engines delist content involving terrorist content or child abuse. Now, you know, again, the child abuse, it's, I think it's relatively easier to define what that means. Um, the terroristic content, on the one hand, it can be easy to define that. On the other hand, it, 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 as you get more and more uh, toward questions of um, ideology and other sorts of things, maybe it gets a little more difficult. There was another law passed in France in 2017 that criminalized individuals habitually accessing online services without legitimate reason, which include um, terroristic type content. So whereas the 2014 law primarily goes at the service providers, the 2017 law went at individuals and their conduct online. And it was a way of uh, also allowing the government to monitor the activities of certain individuals online and not, not just the speech they were doing, but the sites they were visiting. That one actually, the French Supreme Court, French highest court, declared unconstitutional under the French Constitution. So you can see there is, you know, in France as well, as we have seen in the US with FISA and other things, constitutional questions about some of these laws. Um, and of course, the French authorities are still very actively um, prosecuting online terrorism issues, and it does tie to all of the kind of broader um, cultural and, and civil and even international questions we've been talking about.